Good morning, church. All righty. That's a little bit of energy. I like it. Uh, who's here this morning? We'll start there. All right. Who's excited to be here? All right. Who's ready to learn, to grow, to be held accountable, and maybe make some uh, life-changing decisions this morning? Okay. All right. Then a little bit less on that one, like being held in check and accountable, but that's okay. That's okay. Um, look, my name is Matthew, and I'm super excited to be here with you to learn and to grow, but also to be held accountable and maybe check some decisions in my life that have placed me on paths that maybe I need to redirect and detour back to where Jesus wants me to be. Um, and for those of you who don't know, uh, we're, we're happy that you're here online, happy you are here in person, uh, whether you are brand new I know we've got our Connect meeting uh, today, super pumped about that. Uh, maybe you've been visiting with us for just a few weeks, or maybe you've been here so long that you remember a time when this clown was even here on staff. And so those were the good old glory days, right? Um, but my name is Matthew, and I am the student pastor here along with the care pastor. And so what that means is I get to hang out with your teenage students on Wednesdays and beyond uh, throughout the week. Um, and I get to uh, be there with you and for you in times of need uh, and in celebration. And so um, I'm super pumped to get to be that for you guys. But uh, what if I changed my intro? What if I took a letter um, out of one of Paul's letters uh, and started introducing myself like this? Um, Paul, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, or excuse me, Christ Jesus, by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. Like, what if I walked up to you for the first time, like, hey, I'm Matthew, and boom, I'm an apostle and all this, that, and the other. And not just me, what about you? What if you changed your greeting to somebody? You are placing what you represent up front, placing your accountability up front with what you are going to talk about. What if we did that? What an intro. Can you imagine uh, making that a part of your greeting to new people? Uh, no longer am I Matthew, pastor to students and caring for others, though that is important and still a part of my identity. Um, no longer am I the fortunate, clearly outkicked my coverage husband of Morgan. Right, Morgan, we're still... Oh, hey, guys, she, we're, she's tolerating me some more, so we're still together. That's good. I'm glad. Uh, although that wasn't as confident as I thought it was going to be. Um, we'll, we'll have a chat after the... I'll do some apologies, whatever, after... Um, no longer am I uh, the generous provider and staunch protector of my progeny, Magnolia Bell and Margot Rose, though that's still important and a part of my identity. And aren't those just normal identifiers that we tell to other people, our social media bios? Matthew Stevens, husband, father, pastor, some sort of um, statement as to the stage of my life and my job title. Kind of boring. But Paul, in most of his letters, starts off by stating who he is in accordance to the will of God. As believers, could we take a page out of that? Like, hey, from the beginning, this is who I am and this is what I'm about. And so as I go through making statements, it should all point back to this thing. That's his identity. That's who he's representing. But Paul... Um, he gives him credit, stating himself as a follower of Christ Jesus. And after his experience with Christ Jesus on the Damascus Road, Paul became a representative of Christ Jesus, laying down his own will and desires and life path for that of God. He was the foremost missionary in the New Testament, heir of preaching and perpetuating the gospel message in the faithful transmission from one generation to the next which has been the heartbeat of the mission from the beginning, passing it down. Today, as we read in 2 Timothy, we will see Paul live out this calling as he writes from his deathbed to Timothy, passing along the baton to continue the work of believers, a work that we assume Timothy and others carried out because Y2K, thousand years ago, we're here learning more about this message that was taught back then, and God is still at work calling us to fulfill that calling today. Before we get into the text this morning, I do want to give a commendation uh, on this idea of passing along generation to generation, truth from generation to generation to some special people in my own life. 
Today we're going to be in 2 Timothy 2, verse 1 through 13, but I want to go back just one chapter to verse 5, where Paul commends Timothy's uh, faith parents, his mom and his grandmother, Lois and Eunice, that were there that helped shape his faith journey out of their own life's journey with faith in Jesus. And so I just want to say thank you to my mom and memo who were here at the 930. Sorry, you missed them. But they were here this morning um, and we started to look over. Uh, you missed them. Uh, I should have taken a picture or a cutout and just kind of had them sitting over there uh, or a picture up on the screen, although I don't think my mom would have let me do that. Um, she said, please do not call us out. And I did. And I'm sure I'll hear about it over lunch. <laughs> but um, I... I, I you want to hear like a cool kind of God story this morning? Like the fact that they were even here. Look, like it was not uh, set in stone that I was going to be here this morning preaching from this particular passage. And it just so happens that I'm here because Brian is on sabbatical and I swapped with Tyler from week four to week two. And my daughter's birthday, three, she just turned, um, had that this weekend, and so mom from Arkansas came down to help celebrate from her and Memo, who uh, is a faithful streamer to our online um, gatherings, uh, goes to a different church. Has been a member there for longer than I've been alive. But they came here this morning, and they got to sit and listen and lift me up in a message that actually talks about a person who was built up by their mom and grandmother. How cool is that? Yeah, pure coincidence, right? God had nothing to do with that, right? But I just think that's cool. And so uh, I told them, I'll tell these chairs, I guess, thank you, I love you, just so that um, I get all the words checked off in my message. Um, but I do. I, I thank them for walking out their journey with Jesus and out of the overflow of their life poured into me, helping me understand the rhythms of life with Jesus and without Jesus, the consequences without and the, the rewards and the boons with. And I, I say that for me, and I'm thankful for that for me, but I'll, I'll take a quick moment. Uh, I said out of the overflow of their life. A lot of us in here are parents, right? I, I'm a parent myself. But if I'm not spending personal time with Jesus, what do I really have to share with my own children? If I go beyond just my household and I'm fulfilling the commission of my life as a believer, as a representative of Christ, and I don't have that personal relationship with Jesus, I have no overflow in my own life. Am I a good and effective sharer of the gospel? No, I'm not. And so as we talk this morning, as we have spoken in weeks past and say, hey, get out there and go do the goodwill of the Lord. Well, what we're doing is we're asking an impossible task of each and every person, not just you, but me too, because we're all co-leaders in this mission for Christ. And if we don't have that personal relationship with Jesus, guess what? You can't help someone else get there. So the task we're asking is impossible unless you've been filled with the Spirit, given the power and love that you need to accomplish those goals. You may be thinking, Matthew, I heard you talk about your mother and grandmother. That's great for you. Congratulations. But I didn't have a mom, a dad, a grandmother, a grandfather who modeled their faith for me. Must have been nice. Can I offer a little bit of hope, a little bit of joy this morning for you? Uh, you may not have had that in your life. And I'm not claiming that my life has been perfect or struggle-free since then. But can I offer you, hey, you're in the right place. That maybe you didn't have that, and, and I offer sincere apologies for the struggles that you went through without Jesus as a source and anchor in your life. But you're here now, seeking to grow in him, and that you are going to break that cycle in your own life and family's life, and your children and children's children will be blessed by the decisions you are making today. God bless you for that. And so you may not have enjoyed that in the past, but think about children and grandchildren moving forward. We're taking it seriously. Thank you. Today, as we read in 2 Timothy, we will see Paul live out this calling as he writes from his deathbed to Timothy. 
passing along the baton to continue the work of believers. A work that we assume that he carried out. Uh, oh, sorry, I moved. No. <laughs> Guys, it stayed all together. Praise God. God is good. God, you are good. Whew, that could have been an interesting three or four minutes as Matthew tries to figure out where, what notes go where. Um, but in God's faithfulness, he knew that I was going to do that, and he kept it all together. Whew. Paul knew that his death was imminent, and as he wrote his second letter to Timothy in Ephesus, he was imprisoned in a hole in the ground. This is where this letter came from. A letter that we don't even know he actually penned himself. There was probably someone dictating it for him because he was in chains and in a frail state where his body could not have written this letter. However, we do know that this is from Paul to Timothy. He penned a passionate letter to his son in the faith. And it was clear to Paul that his life would soon be at an end. This was not like previous imprisonments where he was going to be in for just a little bit and be let out. But for preaching in Rome at this time under Nero, after the fire through Rome, they were looking for people to blame. And guess what? Christians, low-hanging fruit. And so not only was he in prison, was on death row. And so out of that, he writes this letter. And he longed to see Timothy in person, who was still at Ephesus, where he left him first letter. And knowing that we may not, he may not see him again, he gives us, in writing this letter, very practical and sage wisdom that we can apply in our own lives. And Paul encouraged Timothy to stay true during an age of apostasy. What's apostasy, Matthew? Uh, people walking away from their faith. And so just to point out that this is still relevant today, 2,000 years later, uh, do we know anyone walking away from the teachings of faith? Yeah, so I would say it applies. Uh, Paul was clear that there would be challenges, burdens, struggles during his ministry. Has anyone ever uh, been persecuted or had a struggle or been challenged or been burdened uh, doing the work of the Lord? Yeah, then I'd say that it applies, right? Um, and look, because this does have relevancy for us today, I would call, I would urge you in your ears, uh, as we say in our household to our five-year-old, have listening ears this morning so that we can pick up some truth and add it to our lives. And not just uh, a note for us to write down here on a Sunday morning, but an etching on our very soul that would change the way we live on a Monday morning at work, on a Thursday night at the ball game, or a Friday or Saturday night where we think time is our own and we can do what we want. Not just a Sunday morning moment, but this idea that we are living a new lifestyle for Christ. And that all decisions and directions have meaning. That we would represent Christ in all that we do. In this letter, Paul is talking to Timothy. But also in this letter, God is talking to you. He's talking to me. And we can either be a part of that or we can reject it. There's really only two decisions this morning. God has a calling to be and remain faithful in each one of our lives. Are we going to take that to heart and remain faithful to him? 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. And the reason I think that it says this, like, remember, like, Scripture is talking to people in this moment. And yes, it has relevance on our life today, but why would Paul be saying this to Timothy? Well, Timothy was a shy person. And he knew that this person was going to need to go and boldly teach to people, general population. But also later in the chapter, or later in this, uh, this letter, he says, hey, I need you to confront some other leaders, People that have the silver tongue that are using the word to gain power, that are pushing people away from Jesus for their own gain. I'm going to need you to confront that. Timothy's like, oh, that's not me. <laughs> I don't have that personality. Uh, I don't want to confront people. But Paul says, hey, look, it's not your personality. It's not out of your power. It's the spirit that lives within you that provides the opportunity to give you strength over your own weaknesses. 
And just as Paul is speaking truth and encouragement and accountability, that moment like, ah, that kind of shy away moment, God is speaking to you and to me that morning, this morning as well. We have weaknesses, right? Any perfect people in the room? No. And that's okay. God understands that. God recognizes that still has called us to something and gives us the power and the tools that we need to overcome those things. Maybe for you, you are shy and confrontation or even just speaking to a stranger or to someone you know is mildly panic attack mode. Like, or maybe you don't care who you talk to, but maybe you need to have a little extra self-control in some conversations. I hear some chuckles. I hope that's a self-chuckle and not about the person they're sitting next to. God has given us the tools that we need to carry out his mission. He recognizes that we have faults and that we have fears. And just like Paul spoke life into Timothy, God is speaking life into us in this moment. And look, all this is coming from a man who is imprisoned and on death row for preaching I really hope there's not a lot of blue lights out uh, when I walk out this morning. And look, if he's not making excuses to stop going due to his circumstances, really, what excuse do we have in ours? And church, look, we think we have so much time, right? Uh, but we get busy and we start to put off and to put off, lacking the self-discipline that he mentions in the verse above, not recognizing that our time is limited and the task is looming we think we can put off to do later, but we aren't promised later, are we? We've been given power now. We've been given the task to love now. And look, what if we took our calling as seriously as Paul did even then? How would that change our motivations, our urgencies, and our actual actions? And look, many of us sit here this morning, self-included, identifying as a person of faith, right? Surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. We claim that we represent Christ. But outside of this moment, where it's easy to raise our hands, it's easy to say the things of Jesus. Monday through Saturday, would people not in here, the other witnesses in our life, would they say that we represent Jesus well? We claim to be an ambassador of Christ here on a Sunday morning, but oftentimes we can live the life of an apostate the rest of the week. I say that not to condemn, but to offer a metric, some reflection on our own lives so that maybe, if we need to, we make the decisions out of grace and forgiveness, of course, so that we can be effective in the mission for Christ. So with that... Let's finally get into some text, all right? 2 Timothy 2, verse 1. You then, my son, meaning faith son. So uh, Timothy's father was alive and in the picture, but not a believer. And there was Eunice, there was Lois, but Paul actually took him as a mentor and taught him as if it was his son. And so that's where you may have been in church culture for a while. Hey, everyone needs a Paul, everyone needs a Timothy. This idea of you need someone speaking uh, truth because they have some experience into your life, and you need to have someone in your life that you're speaking truth into, the Paul to Timothy. That's where this is coming from. So my faith. Uh, and there was also more than just mental. Like, they were close. He loved this man. He's one of the la- I mean, it's the last book that we have from Paul in the New Testament, and it's a letter to Timothy. Like there was some affection here. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. I don't know if you were here last week, but Tim, out of Timothy, talked about how we are all co-leaders in this mission for Christ. Same here. And so I ask, because I've been asking myself this question as I've sat in the text, are you, am I, a reliable person to pass this truth off, to pass to others? Am I qualified to teach? And not do you have the default qualifications, because guess what? You don't, I don't, no one does. Have you spent time with the truth giver to pass along that truth? 
So this morning, as we pass along this impossible task, would you consider yourself reliable or qualified? Two things that can happen. Verse 3, join me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except for competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Verse 7, reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained, and therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Stay with me. Last couple of verses. Home stretch. Here is a trustworthy saying. If, he die, if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, ugh, he will disown us. And if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. A lot. You stuck with me? Well done. Two thumbs up. And because this is a huge passage full of truth, we're only going to pull out three this morning, okay? And here they are, humility and sacrifice, hardship in sacrifice, and hope from sacrifice. Let's take a look back at verse 3 to start. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Paul is reminding Timothy who is in charge and on whose example and command the following decrees are coming. Paul's not telling Timothy to be like or to mimic Paul. If we are in a mentor-to-mentee relationship, yes, there may be some modeling that we do, but hey, we don't say, be like Matthew, be like me. We say and point to Jesus, be like Jesus. And Paul is saying that to Timothy. As you take over this mantle, you're not taking on Paul's mantle. You're not Paul to people, but you are Jesus to people. He's pointing back to God as the commanding officer in this parallel to say, it is on the authority of God and God alone I'm telling you these things. Not the secrets of life that I've uncovered, but the source of truth and authority on which I speak come from the one and one above. Guys, as we speak truth to people, we need to make sure it is the what? Truth. That we need to spend time with the truth giver. In an age where there are false teachers that Paul is asking Timothy to confront, in an age where there's false teachers, where we are asking you and I'm asking me to confront, we need to make sure that we know what the truth is because we are spending time with the truth giver. Amen? Are you spending time with the truth giver? Are you qualifying yourself for those conversations? In verse 9, it says, This is my gospel. For which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Hallelujah. Paul the subordinate, meaning uh, he's the one under the commanding officer, he's actually the one suffering, making the sacrifice here. Yet he's rejoicing. He's saying the preacher's in prison, but the word of God is still moving on and transforming lives. Hey, look. We're going to take just a moment, okay? Because I know there are some people in here that they take this calling very seriously. And it's okay. We've got in a group of people, people in varying places on their journey, okay? And that's okay. There's love and grace for everyone. People that have been at it for a long time and people that are just now starting. And there are people that have been at it and at it and at it. And and sometimes you just don't just get frustrated. You ever been stalled out or, man, you really tried and feel like not seeing a whole lot of fruit? feel like you're throwing seeds everywhere. We've been watering, making sunshine, cultivating the ground, all the plant analogies. Paul's saying, hey, I, the human, have been stopped. There may have been times where out of your silence or even out of your obedience that you spoke the truth to someone and, man, it was passion-filled and they just looked at you like, okay, whatever. 
and you got frustrated. And maybe it wasn't encouraging for you to continue to go, to keep up, to have that next conversation with that person or with someone new. Just like Paul here, you may be stalled out because you in your finiteness or inability to fully and accurately portray the gospel in all moments to all people, God's word is at work and is powerful and thankfully more powerful than any words, small w words, that we could ever say. So I say that, one, to calm us down, but also to encourage you to continue because it's not your work or your work alone. God's not saying, hey, go do for me. No, God goes before us with his word. I'm thankful for that. Because if it was just up to me, guess what? There'd be less people in here this morning than there already are. I mean, like, and I don't say that to say, like, we got a small crowd. I'm saying, like, like it, God's word is big and huge. And thankfully, it's not all up to me, but thankfully, I get to be a part of it. The preacher's in prison, but the word of God is still moving on and transforming lives. Brings us to our first point, humility and sacrifice. Paul is telling Timothy that as a follower of God, he must do that very thing. Follow. That Timothy must humble himself, sacrificing the wills and desires that he has for himself and replace them with the will and desire of the Father, his commanding officer. In the following verses, 4, 5, and 6, Paul connects these attributes to three things, furthering his analogy to the soldier, then an athlete, and a farmer. When referring to the soldier in verse 4, he's first telling us that the Soldier has to lay aside all secular pursuits. And the Christian must be willing to do the same. So I ask a question. Are you following his pursuits or your own? It has to do with priority, right? Are you prioritizing yourself or him? And it really comes down to the question, who or what is sitting on the throne of your life? And we start there because nothing else really matters if something other than Jesus is on that throne. Verse 5, Paul shifts gears to that of an athlete. In order to receive the victor's crown, to be sex successful in this gospel pursuit, we must compete according to the rules. What happens when you compete in sports and you don't follow the rules? You cheat. Well, you, you get penalized or you get disqualified. So, Matthew, where do we find the rules to live and to reach as God wants? Well, thankfully, we're reading out of it today. That's right. Scripture. It's where we get all of our rules. God loved us so much that when he said go and do, he gave us examples and truth to speak out of. God loved us so much that he gave us a tangible part of him, even though he knows that we can't fully grasp a, an unseen, indescribable God, he still gave us this version to know some of his character, some of his deeds, and who he is, and how he loves us, and how we can respond to him. So if we're looking for what do we do and how do we do it, God has given us the very tool that we need. Verse 6, the farmer. What's the first thing that comes to mind when we think of a farmer, a good farmer? Probably a good work ethic, right? Hard work. The main thought here in this verse is about labor and discipline, striving to yield a crop. And in the same way, a believer must sow to see and cultivate the growing plants. There's a process. You don't just walk out with a bag of seeds, right? Like it takes a little bit of tossing in the right place, and then once you toss them, there's cultivation to the land. There's a process in a person's journey Thankfully for you, people took time to cultivate your heart, right? God put people in your life to help grow you in this season so that we may in turn help to grow others. Don't be frustrated when someone doesn't immediately get it or when someone is super bumped up like, hey, Jesus, and then next week they may revert a little back to their old life because habits can be hard, right? Human flesh can be really tempting, and we can sometimes be frustrated with other people. But the Bible says, hey, be a good farmer, hard work, sacrifice to cultivate growing plants, growing people. 
And look, Paul understands humility and sacrifice like few others. So he is preaching what he practiced. And you may, you may remember the apostle Paul was once Saul of Tarsus. And he once lived a life for himself. It just so happened that that life was in direct opposition of God's people. He led out on the sniffing out and snuffing out of these new little Christs, Christians, to kill, to steal, to destroy, much like the enemy, to kill believers, to steal their momentum, and to destroy this new religious movement. Because remember, as Paul is preaching this or teaching this to Timothy, Jesus has recently, only recently ascended back to heaven after living on this earth as a man. So it's still new, it's still fresh, and the devil's doing everything he can to squash this before it really gets started. But after his experience on the road to Damascus, Saul humbled himself before the Lord. He sacrificed his own will, his own ambition, his own desires for that of the new authority in his life. And Paul started to ask God, what is it that you want from me? He submitted the rest of his life to serving God by reaching men and women with the gospel. God has called us to do the exact same thing. He created us to be in a healthy and productive and loving relationship with him. But make no mistake, there's a clear rank disparity in that relationship. That we are to serve and sacrifice self for him. That we are to lay down our own lives for that of the life he has for us. John the Baptist, another colossal name in scripture, an older cousin to Jesus the man, said it like this in John 3.30, he must become greater and I must become less. And that could be so tough. But that is what God has called us to do, to sacrifice self. Let me ask again, have you come to the point in your life where you have humbled yourself, sacrificing your own plans to better serve your purpose, the purpose that God has for you? Point two, hardship in sacrifice. Hardship in sacrifice. Paul is clear and frequent in his acknowledgement that what he is saying isn't easy. It's hard work, and it will come with hardship. Let's take a quick look through some of the verses. Verse three starts with endure hardship. Verse six, hard work. Verse nine, I am suffering. Verse 10, I endure. Verse 12, if we endure. 13 verses, five instances where it's all about hardship and enduring. I think he's pretty clear about what he's going to uh, receive and go through as he goes on this mission. Yeah, pretty clear. And not only is Timothy going to go through these things, but guess what? You are too. I am too. Christian life is not an easy one. It's not a perfect one. It's not a struggle-free one. It's just not. If you've ever heard that from anyone, it is a lie. If that person's on easy street, they probably don't know Jesus as well as they say they do. To steal a phrase from Tyler just a few weeks ago, it ain't easy. Paul's up front with what he is asking of Timothy. And there will be moments, seasons of hardship. You will offend people. You will make enemies. There is the enemy apostasy, as we've already talked about, physical, mental, emotional trials. Then there's self, right? Selfishness, laziness, doubtfulness, all the things that we go through in mind, body, soul, but to endure. And look, it's worth it. Church, we endure because it's worth it. Why do we endure? Let's take a look at verse 10. I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Look, eternal glory and salvation is on the line. And so if we endure, it is worth it, not just for self, but for others, so that others may come to know him. So church, we need to get fired up, right? You need to get fired up, get to the point where you have spent time with the truth giver so that you may disseminate the truth because big things are on the line. Eternity is on the line. Eternal glory and eternal salvation is on the line for you and for others. And if that's not a motivating piece for you to move, I really don't know what is. It's something that I, I continually remind myself because I promise there are days when I don't want to. There are days that physically I don't feel like it. Or there are frustrations I have that keep me from working. 
but I have to remind myself to push through and to endure because it's not about me. Others' salvation is on the line. And what if I miss a single day with somebody? Am I guaranteed another opportunity with that person? No, I'm not. Circumstances may change. Circumstances do change. Opportunities that were may not be. Eternal glory and salvation is on the line. And look, hallelujah, for a God who cares enough to restore our brokenness and even use our brokenness to raise us up and share in his glory. There's a reason to endure. Not just, hey, you're going to just because. And there's a reward if we do. And look, to backtrack just a second, I shed a little light on a little word that some of you may have heard. Ears may have perked up just a little bit. Uh, the word elect in that last verse, for the sake of the elect. Uh, and some of you may have taken umbrage with it. I don't know. But anyone who has studied or struggled through the theology of election uh, might have some questions here. <coughs> like, am I working just for people that God has already pre-selected? Right? And look, when we're talking about the elect here, uh, the Greek is pretty clear. This isn't the pre-selection. This isn't God lining up every human who has ever been and said, hey, you're going to heaven, you're going to hell, you're going to heaven, you're going to hell. It's very clear in the Greek here that Paul is using that this is about a person choosing God. And that when a person chooses God, God chooses to admit them. And it's for the work that we do for that person. Essentially, if you choose to believe Jesus came to die in your place for your sins, meaning uh, the free will of the choosing, the choice in this situation, if we choose to believe Jesus came to die uh, in our place for our sins, we submit ourselves to his lordship, God sees our sin debt as paid, thank goodness, granting us citizenship into the messianic kingdom. But look, if we reject him here on earth, our time here, He's going to do the same. And we'll get into that just a little bit later because it brings it up in just a few more verses. All right? So we'll suspend that for just a moment and get back to point two. Paul understands hardship in sacrifice, but he also acknowledges what's at stake if we can endure Christ. As a man who was beaten, stoned, imprisoned, and ultimately executed, Paul endured to the end despite the hardship and becoming a martyr so that others may come to know Christ Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, sharing in the eternal glory God has for those who have chosen him. He saw it through to the end. Are you, am I, willing to humble yourself before the Lord, to endure the hardship that comes from his service, to have those difficult conversations with others, to lay down personal desires, to go the extra mile, to serve an area or a neighborhood that is underserved, underprivileged, even dangerous, to plant a church, to move, to go, to give. I don't know what God's calling is on your life, and there's a lot of ways that our lives do intersect, but there's a personal an interesting and special calling that God has on your life that is unlike anyone else's. Are you willing to humble yourself into the hardship, sacrificing yourself for his cause, for Jesus and Jesus alone, that others may come to know him? Are you representing him in a reliable and qualified way? Point three, hope from sacrifice. I'm going to kind of bury the lead here in just a moment uh, where sacrifice here is not our sacrifice, but thankfully Jesus' sacrifice. When Jesus came to live as God and man here on earth, sacrificed himself in payment for our sin, causing this wedge from a holy God, bridging that gap. And because he sacrificed himself, we get to know God. We get to, or he has restored that relationship back to him. So there's hope from his sacrifice. 
And look, I've talked a lot about the previous verses, but these last few verses are super plain, and I just kind of want to read through them, all right? Look, these are powerful words that Paul penned for Timothy. It's encouraging, it's filled with hope, and for anyone in the room who may have been a part of another church before this one, who had a pastor who had three points in a poem, guess what? We already had three points, and this is a poem, all right? So nostalgia is filling the room, everyone feels comfortable. Here we go. Here's a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. And if we endure, we will also reign with him. But if we disown him, he will also disown us. And if we are faithless, thankfully he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Look, guys, if we humble ourselves before the Lord, exchanging our old lives, meaning plans, ambitions, desires, for new life in him, enduring the hardships of service to the king, we will live and reign in eternal glory forever with Christ. Amen. Church, we've heard a lot this morning, some truth, some things we can add to our lives, kind of focused on self. But in this moment, is it okay with you if we kind of end on a, a God moment? how magnificent he is. That even if we are faithless, we've heard the truth, uh, we disown him, it doesn't change who he is. Even if we are faithless, he remains faithful, it says in verse 13. And that gives me hope that God is who he is. He's good, he's holy, and he's righteous. And he always will be. Hmm. So to finish today, we're going to take a couple of minutes, all right? I wish we could do a little bit longer. Good news is you can do this tomorrow multiple times. You can do this Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, doesn't matter. Verse 7 says this, reflect on what I am saying for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. I do have the privilege of being a pastor here and teaching and leading us, but you know what? You have a personal relationship with Jesus, and Jesus speaks directly to you, and Jesus loves you. And if you reflect, guess what? He's going to help you understand what Scripture is, what he's trying to tell you. And we're going to do that this morning. I'm going to step over here, very literally, for just a couple of minutes, and we're going to reflect on the things that God is telling you. And not just this morning. I really hope that this is a practice that we can take week in and week out. God has a message for you. I believe that. Are you listening? I hope you reflect and listen this morning. Through the heartfelt letter of an imprisoned Paul, Timothy, along with all God's people, are presented with a reminder of the glorious privilege of representing God to others and the need to continue in this good work, even in the face of opposition. Faithful obedience to live sent in this life is the call. Paul reminds us through his letter of the great reward that awaits those who keep their focus fixed on Christ and persevere to the end. Timothy and we alike must not lose heart, though the world is broken and marred by sin. Jesus is the sufficient source of strength as we faithfully fulfill his purpose with this life. As you sit with the truth shared today, we would love to pray for and encourage you as you grow to know God and what it means to live in relationship with him. You can get the conversation started today by simply texting your first name to 601-397-6111. Our ministry team would love to pray for you and walk with you as you respond to God's grace. As we close out our time today and prepare to scatter as the church, let's speak out our declaration together. We believe the great exchange took place when Jesus, who had no sin, became sin for us so we could know God. We exist to see people exchange their old life for new life in Christ and live out their purpose. Christ's love compels us to exchange ideas for truth. God's word is our standard. Selfishness for serving, we will serve others. Pleasing for reaching, we will share our faith. Keeping for dispersing, we will make disciples. Forgetting for celebrating, we will praise God. We are the church.